Well, so first of all, I want to thank you for all uh, coming. Our group is growing a little bit, and I greatly appreciate you. So, how many of you have actually read up to P twenty T? How many have read nothing? All right. So, we are talking about leadership and self deception. So, uh, Adam, why don't you tell us what self deception is? Well, there's seven definitions of self-deception <laughs> so far. <laughs> uh, the first one being that uh, when there's something that you can do for somebody that you decide not to, that's when you betray yourself. Okay. And, and that's definitely an interesting way, and we're definitely going to talk about that in a minute. So what's your definition of self-deception? Um, when I betray myself, um, when I know that there's something I should do for someone, and I think that I'm done. Okay, I, if I'm to sum it up, I think that it's um, like I I want to always be. If I could turn it into my my own language, I want to always be blessing people. And when I'm not, I am betraying myself because there's, there's there's something I want to do for somebody, but. I'm not doing it because I'm being selfish or I've got a busy day the next day or whatever, then I betray myself. And then it's just this cascading problem after problem after problem after problem. And now I'm a germ. And now I'm just spreading germs. And everybody has the same problem. And that's what happens inside of, of you know, full communities, of offices and all of that. That's why they're trying to get us to think outside of the box. When we're in the box, we're becoming a germ. And I, in, 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 I like it. And one of the interesting things about this book to me is that there are so many different layers of it. Yeah. It's hard to sum it up. I really think that self-deception is not seeing that I am actively playing a role in creating the problems that I say I want to solve. Mm -hmm. So just like the example that we've talked about a few times of when you're frustrated that your child is not being responsible. So you give them a, you know, a, an unrealistic curfew, trying to force them to be responsible, and not only act responsibly, you nitpick little stupid things. Uh, you squeal the tires of a car, you, uh, you cut it really close, instead of actually acknowledging the fact that they were responsible. And the, the real question is, why do we do this? And it comes down to you know, how we see things and how we see people. And uh, this sort of was about chapters 5 through 16, and, and the chapters are very short in here. And one of the real thing I want you to think about is this. What causes communication problems is deeper than behavior and skills. And this is something that I struggled with as we were going posture to advertising. I meet with somebody and I say something and they would respond poorly to it. Now, my partner and wife, we've been at a meeting with the exact same person, and she would say, I swear, the exact same thing that I did, <laughs> and get a totally different response from that person. It used to drive me <laughs> nuts. Because I was studying leadership and communication, and I was trying to master all these skills, and yet she consistently got much better response from people than I did. Even though I can tell you, here's the actual skills that I was using. So was it your delivery at this? <laughs> so I worked out on delivery. <laughs> Insane. So in 1988, I was one of the early adopters of NLP got my 
master certification in LP from John Grimmer and Duke DeGlover, two of the founders of LP. And still, my wife, without any training, got better response. Why? I would say probably because she was being authentic mm -hmm. to herself mm -hmm. and was fluid with the conversation, was not trying to gameplay in her mind about, like, okay, so how do I respond to this situation or she was being real? And, and part of that is definitely right. In the, to me, what we need to look at is deeper than behavior and skills. And uh, this is sort of the whole point of the book, is that you can't solve the problems. And, and to me, until I really understood this, I always thought, well, if I got enough skills, I learned enough techniques, I could communicate effectively. And yet what I found was that that was not always the case. That you could do behaviors, you could practice techniques, and this applies to sales presentations. I've been fortunate enough to watch lots of managers over the years, lots of realtors. And I watched Phil Perman do a listing presentation. And he does say yeah, a lot of things differently than most, but it's not that different. But he gets very different results than an agent saying the exact same thing. I watch managers recruiting agent and get very different response, even though they say the same thing. I see this in husband and wife relationships, kid relationships. So what's deeper than behavior and skills? And what I really believe it is, and what this book is about, is when we see people as objects, we are in this area of self-deception. And, and Lisa, can I think you just close that door? Yes. So here's the real question. Why does it matter when we see people as objects versus people? They can sense that. And that's really it. They can sense it. Yeah. And this is the one thing that, you know, we can't fake. You can't technique your way out of sensing, if people sense that, do, is that, are they really seeing me as a person or am I an object? And now, if people sense that you see them as an object, no matter what techniques you use, what uh, communication things you try and use, whether it's NLP or you know, anything else, I found it fast flat because people sense that you really don't care about them. Mm -hmm. And it just destroys any chance of well, getting this out. Now, I realize I made a head up. So the question is, how do we get into the box? Into the box? So what were we trying to get out of that? Yeah. Well, yeah, so <laughs> and this is this is one of the things that, that you do struggle with, especially if you haven't read the book, is the terminology. So how do we stop seeing people as people and start seeing them as objects? And according to them, that's what they call seeing people in the box. <laughs> When we build ourselves, I, I, I'm on diagram, you know, on the diagram on page one, um, one with three, where um, the husband, the, the baby is crying, the wife and the husband are asleep, um, and, and the wife keeps sleeping and the husband's laying there awake thinking, you know, I want to go help the baby, but she should go help the baby. And, um, and so his choice is to honor 
kids, you know, going and helping the baby, or betraying it and making her the bad guy. And um, and so the way he would see himself is he would see himself as a victim and hardworking and important and fair and sensitive and a good dad and a good husband. Meanwhile, he's thinking she's lazy, she's inconsiderate, and we blow this up. She's um, unappreciative, insensitive, she's a faker, she's a lousy mom, she's a lousy wife, and, and, he, and we tend to make that way bigger, blow that way out of proportion than it is. And I could completely relate to this. <laughs> It's like, oh my gosh. So that's when we're in the box. So, and so, that's when we're in the box, and all those things happen. The, the real question is, how do we get in there? How do we, what, what happens that makes us stop seeing people as people and turn them into objects? Could it be judgment? We just consider ourselves. We're already thinking about ourselves. In, in definitely, those, definitely play into it. <clears throat> you know, according to the book, we get there through an act of what they call self betrayal. Mm -hmm. So, the question is, what is self betrayal? I think it's kind of what Lisa was saying. So, self betrayal is partly a judgment, partly the simple mindset. And in this book, they talk about seeing people as objects mm -hmm. or people, and when you're seeing people as objects, they say you're in the box. Mm -hmm. Now, this was a terminology that somebody came up with, and so just understand that it's a conceptual construct. They've written a couple of books since this one, and one of the things that I like about their later work is that they talk about this as being an inward versus an outward mindset. Am I inward focused or outward focused? If I'm inward focused, that would be I'm in the box. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at it from my perspective. If I'm outward focused, I see other people as people that have needs, hopes, dreams that are just as valid, just as important as me. I'm not better than or worse than anybody else out there. And to me, that's a, that's a great concept. I still like the way they talk about this book better in the, if you read the latest book, the, it's called The Outward Mindset. To me, it doesn't do as good a job of illustrating the principles as leadership and self-deception does. So self-betrayal is just this sort of sense that I did that I should do something from. And, and the example that you mentioned a brother and his wife laying in bed when they had a newborn. And that they had a tough day, he was sleeping there. Then he starts waking, crying in the middle of the night. And he wakes up and he has a sense that he should go and take care of their son so that his wife Nancy could sleep. But he's tired, so he doesn't do that. And as soon as he doesn't do that, this is what happens in his, his you know, our minds. He starts thinking, well, you know, I've got an important meeting tomorrow morning. And after all, you know, Nancy you know, is the mom, and she should take care of it. You know, she's not working, I've got other responsibility. And you know, we justify everything that we're doing. And as Lisa said, we tend to blow it bad, of course. We become super great, <laughs> super great in our mind, and the other person becomes much worse. And that's that act of self-betrayal. You know, when we betray ourselves, this is what happens intuitively. I begin to see the world in a way that, well, Justifies. Justifies my self-betrayal. Mm -hmm. And this is when we stop really seeing and validating other people's needs, humanness, if we will. And now we're justifying that, you know, all the stuff is on me, is I've got all these, these responsibilities. 
And here's where it becomes to me crazy. When we are looking to justify ourselves, we need to see other people badly. Mm -hmm. We need to find fault in our clients, our other agents, in our brokers, on everybody out there, so that we can justify treating them badly. Now to me, this is the craziness of this whole thing. Because we get caught in this trap, we stop seeing people as just as important and valuable as us, and suddenly we're looking for ways to justify our own bad behavior. And we start finding faults for them. So what's one of the things that they talk about in the book that is the biggest signal that we are not really looking at people as people? Which scenario? No, which, what, what's the one thing in you know, our language patterns and our behavior that tends to signal that we are not seeing people as people, that we're looking at them as objects? Can make excuses? So much excuses. But it's not excuses. When we're looking for an excuse for our bad behavior, what do we tend to do? Blame others. Mm -hmm. exactly. Blame others. <laughs> when we blame others, uh -huh. they're this way, they're this way, it's, it's, it's their fault. Yeah. And their bad behavior justifies mine. Because if theirs is worse than mine, in my mind, I can justify being a difficult, nasty person. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about this for a second, this is really one of those weird things. Think about it. If somebody else treats you poorly, does that really give you justification to treat them poorly? Absolutely. See, this is this is one of those interesting things when we think about it objectively. We say, "Well, yeah, tit for tat." Yeah. But that's what we're, that's this is the thing that to me, once I really understood this, it made a huge difference because in my own behavior. As soon as I start being aware that I'm blaming, it's a giant signal that says, oh, I'm probably not seeing them as a human being. And so one of the things that I found very useful is to start thinking, really monitoring my blame behavior. If I start blaming anybody internally in my mind, that's a giant signal that says, oh, so what's going on here? This is probably my self-deception. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to play into the soul. So to me, this is where we can start to learn and, and find a practical skill set that says, gosh, what can I do to take a step back? Think about this in negotiations. Anybody ever had a buyer and seller and they're negotiating and the buyer is blaming the seller and the seller is blaming the buyer for being difficult and challenging. And they use their, the other person's difficulty or perceived difficulty as justification for not being mean or vindictive or stubborn or just plain stupid. <laughs> and once you start being aware of it, you start seeing this happening mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is figuring out how do I catch myself when I'm blaming others so that I can take a step back. And 
We see this scenario of undermining communication, sales, everything else. So, <clears throat> think about it. If a client is being difficult, uh, how do we start perceiving that client? Should we give them our best, outstanding, most patient service? You should, but you don't do it. <laughs> so because they're being difficult and challenging, should we be difficult and challenging back? Yeah. Yes. I want you, but we don't. Because it's my job. Well, shouldn't we be in their behavior, though? No, I mean... No, no, I want to explore this because this is an interesting concept. And I, I totally get where you're going with this, but, like, sometimes part of the negotiation with your own able client is letting them know that you're going to fight fire with fire because if you reward them... I'm, look, I'm just going on a different... It's okay, don't, don't look that much. If you reward them then they feel justified in being able to treat you poorly. But if you if you hedge it, if you get them or they're off, then you just and then they say, well what, what's your problem? I know that this is the wrong thing. I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> but I just think this is an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Right? To me it's, it's a very important concept. And one of the things that I that sort of Lisa's example earlier was that you can do any behavior seeing people as people or as objects. So you can be as strong as possible. You can say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to draw this line in the sand, I'm going to stand my ground, but you can do it with a attitude of manipulation or an attitude of you're a person, I'm a person, and we're trying to come to a, a ground of this. Mm -hmm. And that difference, that's the underlying thing beneath it. And I think we get caught up in thinking, in the book they talk about, a lot of times we think we'll be too soft if we treat people as other people. But we can treat people as firm or as hard as we need to be in that situation, but still see them as a person. So, think about an example that maybe will make more sense, is that when you discipline a child, do you think the child can sense if you discipline them out of anger, Still out of care. Yes. Mm -hmm. But when you go, it's playing your children, it's both. <laughs> so, but the way you can do it from a place of, so if, you, if you've had kids, have you ever found yourself disciplining out of anger and then instantly regretting mm -hmm. yeah. what you've done, and you realize that was not right out of the energy. And that undermines the relationship. What I found is that if you discipline your children out of caring, the relationship maintains intact. And this is that underlying level. So it's not that you can be strong, you can, if you're being difficult, you can still draw your boundaries, but still see them as people. And I found that that would invite them to be much more open and receptive so they won't take advantage of you. Mm -hmm. If all of a sudden it drops down to what I call the tit for tat, they, you can tell they're manipulating you and they feel like they're trying to manipulate them back, it tends to create a more negative end result in the end anyway. So I found that Mirroring them doesn't always produce positive outcomes. What you have to do is say, 
what's the thing that's going to produce the best outcome for us all? And always take into consideration the other person. If we approach any negotiation, sales situation, as a zero-sum game, they got to lose it for me to win. Mm -hmm. You're never going to have what I call positive outcomes. It's always got to be approached from, let's find a mutual beneficial solution to it. This is off book, but it's along the same lines of what you're talking about. Um, I took a negotiation class once where, and this is the only thing I can remember out of the entire seminar, but it was a good one. You're the, you're the client and you're the agent. And, and you know, you're negotiating about something and the object is in the middle of the table. But instead, we need to think about being on the same side of the table as our client and be with them in this problem to solve it. You know, how are we going to solve this problem together instead of fighting against each other? Because that just leaves that, uh, you know, feeling if you're fighting against each other instead of with each other working on something. And your end is always the same. I don't think so because if you're, if, you know, let's say something, hang on. Okay, now if I'm not, I mean you're both working towards the same. Oh, okay, you're working towards the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, the, and, you know, we've got to be looking down the line, you know, working with this person again. And as all they're going to remember is that they were fighting against, they felt like they were fighting against us instead of we were fighting together for this when, you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I, I do. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's, 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 it can be hard to describe, but here's the, the, the reality. When we see people as objects, yeah. we justify our own bad behavior. And this is, to me, really what keeps war, justification, you know, anger, problems alive. When we see people as human beings that have just as much right, just as mm -hmm. much value as we do, we tend to treat them very differently. And they can sense that. No matter what our behavior is, and that's the, the hard part to really uh, understand as we see it in ourselves. And it's actually easier to see it in others. Uh, to me, I, I love the example of uh, they, they have a, in their second book, they use the example of the Arabs and the Israelis and how they um, they perceive the exact same faces as their holy grandmas. And both of them, from their perspective, are absolutely right. Mm -hmm. But it's only when they can be better and actually see the other person as a person that they will even consider that their point of view is not right. If we're seeing people as objects, not only do we blame them, but we don't consider that our perception could be wrong because we're so sure we're right. And as we have heard, they absolutely sure we were right, and then later on, found out they were wrong. <laughs> 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 So we know that even if we perceive that we're right, sometimes, but we won't even consider it unless we look at the people opposite of us as human beings. Mm -hmm. and now, we see this a lot more in relationships, husbands and wives. They fight over stupid things when they are seeing the other person as an object. Yeah. And then they see that the other person as a, as a human being, and it, it, it really does change their perception of almost instantly. Have you ever had a fight with your spouse or something like that? And then some time passes, and suddenly you have, I can't believe we fought over that stupid thing. Mm -hmm. It seems so idiotic to you that it was like, how is that possible? Well, that's probably a very good indication that at that point in time you didn't see the other person as a person. You saw them as an object that you had to win against or manipulate or you know, be 
together. You are looking for justification of your own bad behavior. So, so it's, a, it's the premise of this philosophy that when you treat people poorly, that that's defined in the book as you treating somebody like an object. Is that the assumption? Or can you treat somebody poorly and still believe that they're human? You're just like, hey, human. You can the 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 basic underlying concept in my mind of this is that my way of being, my general perception of the people on the planet has a huge impact on the results I get. If I'm typically looking at people as people, I will invite much more cooperation and positive results no matter what I'm doing. Even if I'm needing to discipline or my child or give bad news to a client or another agent, if I still perceive them as a human being, I will invite a much different style of response from them if I can keep in mind that they're humans. If they're a, a person just as valuable as me. If I start treating them like an object, I invite a very different style of interaction that tends to lead to more, you know, more negative consequences. And that's really the whole underlying philosophy of it. So it's, do I see them now, as I've been studying and thinking about this, I find myself, even though you know, I've read these books a whole bunch of times, thought about them, talked about them, I still find myself slipping into treating people like the objects. It's just now, um, I think every one of us tends to do that. And the more we're aware of it, the, the more we can get outside of the box. The whole point of this book is that in a work context, it doesn't even seem like, what does this have to do with work? But if we don't see people as ob or if we don't see people as people, we're seeing them as objects. There are always going to be people that we're trying to manipulate, and what ends up happening is that we can't focus on the end results of what we really want to get. And the more we can treat people as human beings, the better response we're going to get as salespeople, as um, agents. And that's really where it brings us to a whole new level. So going back to the A-hole example, in this context, how should you handle that person? Come in, from, from your, yeah. So, I mean, because, it, it, yeah. so, and, and, and here's the thing. You're still looking at it as, there's a difficult, well, able person here. What's my best strategy or behavioral response? And this book would say, the first thing you do is acknowledge that they're being challenging, but I still want to see them as a human being. I still want to acknowledge them. Still and commit. just <laughs> See, and the second you start to think, I still want a commission, but now that person is going to sense that yeah. you're doing it for a mission. Right. Well, I shut my mouth. That's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, then the behavior doesn't matter nearly as much as the underlying sense that you have. That's where I tried with the example at the beginning. My wife and I could say the same things, do the same things, and she would invite a much different response. Not because she was 
doing a better behavioral skill. But underneath, people could sense that she cared about them as people. Where they could mm -hmm. sense from me, I was applying a behavioral technique. And because the behavioral technique was supposed to make it better, I was still being a behavioral, you know, doing behaviors. And the whole point of this book is that you can do anything behaviorally or skill-wise and PC people as people or as objects. And the whole point is if you can see people as people that just have as much value as you do at every point in time, no matter what you say or do, the response you will get is dramatically different. And I will tell you personally, I found this to be very true. Um, it's, it, it makes a huge difference in how people respond back to you. Uh, whether it's in a negotiation, whether it's with your spouse, your kids, um, even with people, um, service professionals out there that you're running into. Yeah. Whether it's the stewardess on the airline. Flight attendant. You haven't been flying since 1970. Oh no! I wasn't that I haven't heard that in a long time. I'm just kidding. So, all of those things, when you can treat, see people as people, you will get a much better response from them, no matter what your behavior actually is. Even if you're being a little bit difficult, that people still feel like, oh, they're still seeing me as a human being, will tolerate a lot more and, and will get a better response. So, that makes sense? Yes. And you know who is so brilliant at this, and she doesn't even know she is, is Mila. And I was having a really big problem with a client, and I was like, I'm oh, just such an asshole, and I just, I'm just, avoiding these calls, and I can't stand it, and, and it just got worse. It was like, I was building him up to be like this monster, you know, and I was this, you know, just trying to help, and that, you know what I mean? And she, she just looked at me and she said, well, it just seems like John needs a hug. <laughs> and I was like, what? And but, but she changed my thought about him. So he's a human being, and this is tough for him. Even if I, you know, and maybe he's faking it, maybe he's lying just to get some money out. I don't know. But if I just thought of him as he needs a hug, this guy needs a hug, and that changed our whole relationship. You know, that's when he got me the Tiffany key. <laughs> yeah. And see, you know, the, the amazing thing is that it often happens that quickly when we can catch ourselves and we realize we're in this, we're in this cycle of being what I call of manipulation of seeing somebody as an object. And when we see people as objects, this is where it becomes this deadly cycle of the more we see them as objects, if they're mistreating us, the more justification we have to mistreat them. And if we're mistreating them, does that invite them to treat us better or worse? Worse. Worse. And then we have this oh whole yeah, cycle that's what happens. Mm -hmm. that comes into it. So in the book... But that's what we're doing every day. We don't, it's just a habit. Mm -hmm. Until we know. Until we learn. That's right. Until we're. Change. The name of the book is Leadership. So I think the whole thing is to put yourself at a, at a higher level of responsible, uh, being responsible mm -hmm. to act and uh, find a way to change your thinking internally to respect and honor people as human beings. But, mm -hmm. And then you raise the bar for everyone in the, the deal. And I know I do this with my 18 year old. I mean, I should be doing it, but I haven't <laughs> talked about this. I just went into this last night, and I'm thinking, 
I'm supposed to be the leader here. I'm not supposed to be getting into this with him. I'm supposed to be setting the bar higher and teaching him better skills to deal with our arguments and our, our conflict. But um, I'm definitely going to be using this. Because <laughs> I think it's a learned behavior. I mean, some of this stuff that you're talking about, where did we learn from, from when we were raised and how were raised and our parents' prejudices? That's right. So. So with, with our teenagers, when they were all in this teenage years, one of the things we found was that we wanted to have some of these discussions. It can be difficult. We gave all of our kids $100 if they would read the books we recommended and could write us a book report. And this was one of the books we had all of our kids read wow. to talk about. And I will tell you, that it changed the relationship and the concepts mm -hmm. so dramatically because now, uh, now they are incredibly good at calling you on it because they don't yeah, call yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah, the box. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but to me, it's like it, it gets that whole thing, and this is where it becomes in the book they're talking about when two or more people are in the box together. What do they do? Unified. And what do they call that? Toxic. Oh, um, yeah. It is definitely toxic. Mm -hmm. So this is the example that uh, Kate and her son had. When her son was late, yeah. mm -hmm. she was looking for things to blame him for. And now, because he was late, his mom was a little bit unreasonable, he blamed her for being unreasonable, and they fed into each other's bad behavior. Mm -hmm. So the more she pressed him to be on time, the more unreasonable she became in his mind. And it creates this circular cycle, and what's that called? It's called collusion. So, well, it's interesting, it's, it really is like, you collude, you say, well, gosh, if you treat me badly, so I'm justified in treating you badly, mm -hmm. I'll treat you badly, so you're justified in treating me badly. Right. And we see the cycle of behavior over and over again. Mm -hmm. When they do something right, it's not good enough. And to me, that becomes that cycle that just creates craziness in our activities. Dysfunction junction, right? That's <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, you now, what do you think we can do to become more aware? So, first of all, I just want to get your feedback and your thoughts on it. Does this basically make sense? And can you see this in your own life? One of those. Yeah. Sure. So Leo, you know, once we're aware of this, what do we do about it? That's at, that's page 119. <laughs> <laughs> so page after this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I wanted to do, because I was always such a hothead and um, huge ego, I just had to learn to when they do that, I just, I understand. I understand. I'm not going to argue with them. I gave up arguing with clients a long time ago. And I, I'm not going to relate what I think, how, how what, I, what I compare that to. But it's just, no, I'm not going to argue with them. So I, I understand. I understand. And somehow that works. And then if they calm down a little bit, then I'll try to reiterate my thoughts. And I know, you know, and, I, and sometimes I'll even say, you know what, like um, John, Personal opinions are like assholes. We all got one, but this is my opinion. Take it or leave it. And sometimes they take it, sometimes they don't. But God, you got to stay calm. You have to stay calm. Well, and, 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 and this is where I think we we have to be very careful in that I see people that are not always calm still they get outstanding results. And again, this comes down to that a deeper level. It's it's how they are seeing 
people. No. So, <clears throat> I mean, if we want to go into you know, biblical examples, when Jesus threw out the money changers, mm -hmm. he was angry. He was you know, showing outwardly aggressive behavior. But the results he produced were probably different than what most people would expect because he was still seeing them as children of God, as valuable. He was trying to make a point, but his sense of love and caring at a, at a core fundamental level, at a deeper level, was still there. So to me, it's like, this goes down to how do I really perceive people? And, and one of the things that I found is that we are so ingrained at looking at behavior that we get caught up in the behavioral thing. Should I remain silent? Should I say something? And what I found is that whatever you decide to do, it will probably be more effective if you do it when you are conscious of this person as a human being. Mm -hmm. When you just take a moment and say, before I have a conversation, let me think about them as a human being. For me, what I find is, you know, I try and say, okay, I bet they have a family. Somebody loves them. They have a father, a mother that loves them. They have kids. They have people that care about them just as my family cares about me. Mm -hmm. They probably have hopes and dreams, goals, just like I do. And the more I can see that they are just like that, and I think, gosh, I think they have feelings just like I do. Mm -hmm. They're just as insecure. I found that now, when I respond, even if I'm still emotionally, you know, heightened or frustrated, the response I get bite back from them is much different. It's funny that with my kids, now that they're all adults, uh, we still have some arguments every now and then. And it was interesting, uh, probably a couple months ago, my oldest son and I were having a heated discussion. And my grandson, his son, asked his dad about it later. He said, you know, Papa, we're having sort of an argument. And I was saying, oh, yeah, we, we, we did have, we had a disagreement about that. And it was interesting because my other year old grandson said, well, uh, my, because my son said, well, did it make you upset or nervous? And he said, well, no, it didn't make me nervous. Not like when you and Mel used to fight. Mm -hmm. You know, you were Wow. And I said, well, what was different? Yeah, that's wild. And he said, well, I can tell you guys loved each other. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's like, you can even fight and project a different... Mm -hmm. Attitude. And so to me, it's like that's that's the underlying process of this. The more we can be conscious that no matter what's going on, can we perceive other people as people that are just as valuable and just as important as we are, and we get away from that. We invite problems. So, insights from today. So, what is the, 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 the frustrating question? But what is the end goal for, and I guess it's we're not there yet, right? Because they both will get us there. First of all, I have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just trying to understand is this, is this helping us to become thought leaders that are going to elevate everyone? Is that the intent of the book? Or is it to 
expose us for the self betrayers that we are and how we can overcome that in any scenario. I'm just trying to, to just so I can... To change the goal of the book is to help us become better communicators with ourselves. With ourselves. Okay. So that become aware. we communicate from a from an authentic intention versus an autopilot knee-jerk response. Okay. Okay. I have found that the more I use the concept of this, the better impact all my communication has. Mm -hmm. Whether it's personally, professionally, everywhere else now. And, and once you know you really understand this concept of collusion, and I see this with agents.
see that real first. Mm -hmm. Any other takeaways, thoughts, comments about today? It's deep. I love it. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, uh, I had a broker in Virginia. We were the top producing uh, Century 21 in the whole state of Virginia. We were small. We were small. Um, but he, he said something to me one time that was so profound, it stopped. It was so silly. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's right. Well, and to me, this is, to me, that philosophy is undermining, uh, is the, sort of the, the foundation of this book. Yeah. And the Arbiter Institute basically is a consulting company that uses these, this philosophy as a consultant for business and of all sorts. Um, I actually love all the stuff they've, they've written. They've written a bunch of white papers on self-deception, on communication. Um, and this was their first book. And it's applied to the workplace a little bit more. Their second book is called The Anatomy of Peace, mm -hmm. which is a little bit more oriented towards family life. But it's the exact same concepts. And the most recent book is The Outward Mindset. And it's conceptually the same thing. And they talk about it in a little bit more general terms. But it's, it's got universal application to, to everything we do in communication. To me, until I understood this literature too, I couldn't understand why some people got such different responses to their marketing. And this is what really got me to, that led me to this work. In it, that, as a marketer creating marketing campaigns for agents, I was always incredibly frustrated because I wanted a, a marketing campaign that would work for everyone. Uh, and my first 20 clients were all very successful agents and everything I wrote for them worked incredibly well. Then I went through and created marketing campaigns for a lot of average agents that didn't work. And I was incredibly frustrated by that. So I was thinking, why does this work for this agent? I mean, the exact same ad, the exact same worked incredibly well for one agent versus another. And I was always struggling with it. To me, this underlying way of being has a huge impact on that. It's, this is why some things work for some people and not for others. And so there's a lot of applications in it when we start looking at it from our marketing perspective, from our communication perspective, our relationship perspective, there's a lot of great value in it. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm such a big fan of their, their work. And hopefully, trying to get you guys out get some value out of it as well. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Greg. Let me make a plug that tomorrow, Lisa is doing her listing presentation. Oh. And uh, it's going to be outstanding. Be so if you want to what watch a listening presentation, yeah, where is it? At? Where is it? <laughs> is it here? It's yeah. here in this room. Okay, Nine what time? Nine, Nine o'clock. Oh. And Lisa is super excited about this. I am so excited. Oh. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna kill it. Yeah. So she volunteered for this. And I did. Mean, she I'm did. insane. <laughs> She I'm did. so insane. But I think she was on drugs that day. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, Denise said, why the hell did you volunteer to do that? And I, I said, I was asking myself that question all week. But honestly, if I, if I don't raise my hand and do it, I won't. And I've been saying it every meeting. My goal is to master the listing presentation, and you're exactly right. but I'm not going to take the yes. time to do it. Yes, you're right. And 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 am I working on perfection? Well, not really. But I want to get started. I want to be 
you know, back on the board and working towards, you know, over this year, mastering the deal. That's awesome. And so I'm doing it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and you can all come because you'll feel really good about yourself. <laughs> <after> I... <laughs>